Continuing, Alastair Crowley's The Diary of a Drug Fiend, Book Three, Purgatorio. And we will probably conclude Chapter Seven Love Under Will, herein. Love is the law. Love under will. I thrilled again this time with a combination of surprise and exultation, which was curiously unintelligible. Then I saw in one corner of the room, behind the array of benches and tables crowded with neatly disposed apparatus, a glimmering form. The back was turned to us. It was on the floor, busily occupied in cleaning up. This is Sir... Peter Pendragon, said Big Lion, who is coming to take charge of the laboratory. My eyes were still unaccustomed to the gloom, but I could see the figure scrambling to its feet. Curtsy and advanced to me, where I stood in the shaft of sunlight that came through the half-open doorway. It was dressed in a knickerbocker suit, a black silk. It wore sandals and black stockings. I recognized Lou. Big Lion said you might want to begin work this afternoon, Sir Peter, she said with dignity. So I have been trying to put the place in some sort of order. I stood absolutely aghast. It was Lou, but a Lou that I had never seen or known. I turned to King Lamas for an explanation. But he was not there. A ripple of laughter ran over her face. The sunlight blazed in her magnetic eyes. I trembled with indescribable emotion. Here was an undecipherable puzzle. Or was it, by any chance, the answer to a puzzle? To all my puzzles. The puzzle of life. I could think of nothing to say but the most lame and awkward banality. What are you doing here? I inquired. My will, of course, came the answer. And her eyes twinkled, and the sunshine as unfathomably as the sea itself. Thou hast no right but to do thy will, she quoted. Do that, and no other shall say nay. Oh, yes, I retorted, with a trace of annoyance. I had still a feeling of reaction against the book of the law. I hated to submit to a formula, however much my good sense, confirmed by my expression, urged me to surrender. But how did you find out what your will was? How did you find out, she flashed back. Why, I stammered, the big lion showed me how my heredity, my natural inclination, and the solution of my crisis all pointed to the same thing. You said it, she answered softly and fired another quotation. The law is for all. Tell me about it, I said. My stupefaction and my annoyance were melting away. I began to perceive dimly that the big lion had worked out the whole situation in a masterly fashion. He had done with his material, us, what I was doing with my material, the laws of mechanics. I discovered my will four days ago, she said, very seriously. It was the night that you and Big Lion climbed deep guile and took so long over Professor Chimney that you missed the champagne dinner. Yes, yes, I said impatiently. And what was it? She put her hands behind her back and bent her head, her eyelids closed over her long slanting eyes, and her red snaky mouth began to work tremendously. While you were asleep after Tiffin, she said, Big Lion took me up to the semicircular seat on the hill above the stranger's house and put me through my paces. He made me tell him all my early life and especially the part just before I met you, when I thought I loved him. And he made me see that all I had done was to try to please myself, and that I had failed, 
My love for him was only that of a daughter for her father. I looked to him to lead me into life, but nothing meant anything to me till the night I met you. At that moment, I began to live. It was you and not Gretel's beastly cocaine that filled my soul with that litany of fullers. I had chanted it often enough, but had never touched it had never touched the spot. That night, I used it to get to you. To get you. I had only lived that I might one day find you. And all my life curled itself from that moment round. You. I was ready to go to hell for you. I did go to hell for you. I came out of hell for you. I stopped taking heroin only because I had to fit myself to help you to do your will. That is my will. And when we found out this morning what your will was, I came down here to get the place ready for you to do it. I'm going to keep this place in order for you and assist you as best I can in your work. Just as I danced for you, I went to Mr. McCall for you in those days when you were blind. I was blind, too, about your will, but I always followed my instinct to do what you needed me for, even when we were poisoned and insane. She spoke in low, calm tones, but she was trembling like a leaf. I didn't know what to answer. The greatness of her attitude abashed me. I felt with utmost bitterness the shame of having wronged so sublime a love of having brought her into such infamy. My God, I said at last, what we owe to Big Lion. She shook her head. No, she said with a strange smile. We've helped him as much as he's helped us, helped him to do his will. The secret of his power is that he doesn't exist for himself. His force flows through him unhindered. You have not been yourself till this morning, when you forgot yourself forgot who you were, didn't know who kissed you, and brought you your breakfast. She looked up with a slow, half-shamefaced smile into my eyes. And I lost you, said I. After Tiffin, when I remembered myself and forgot my work, and all the time you were here helping me to do my work, and I didn't understand. We stood a while in silence. Both our hearts were seething with suppressed necessity to speak. It was a long, long while before I found a word, and when it came, it was intense and calm and confident. I love you. Not all the concentration given by heroin or the exaltation of cocaine could match that moment. The words were old, but their meaning was marvelously new. There had never been any I before, but I thought I was there there had never been any you before when I thought of Lou as an independent being and had not realized that she was the necessary complement of the human instrument which was doing my work. Nor had there been any love before, while love meant nothing but manifold stupid things that people ordinarily meant by it. Love as I meant it now was an affirmation of the inevitable unity between the two impersonal halves of the work. It was the physical embodiment of our spiritual truth. My wife did not answer. There was no need. Her understanding was perfect. We united with the unconscious ecstasy of nature. Articulate human language was an offense to our spiritual rapture. Our union destroyed our sense of separateness from the universe of which we were part. The sun, the sky, the sea, the earth partook with us of that ineffable sacrament. There was no discontinuity between that first embrace of our true marriage and the occupation of the afternoon in taking stock of the effects of the, labor of, the labor of the laboratory and making notes of things we should ask Lala to bring us from London. The sun sank behind the ridge, 
and far above us from the refractory came the sonor uh, the um, the sonorous uh, the sonorous beat of the tom tom which told us that evening meal was ready we shut up the house and ran laughing up the slopes they no longer tired and daunted us halfway to the house we met the tiny dionysus full of importance he'd have been deputed to remind us of a dinner sister athena we laughed to think must have realized that our honeymoon had begun and this time it was no spasmodic exaltation depending on the transitory excitement a passion our stimulants, but on the fact of our true spiritual marriage, in which we were essentially united to each other, not for the sake of either, but to form one bride, whose bridegroom was the work, which could never be satiated, so long as we lived, and we could never, so, and so could never lead to weariness and boredom, the honeymoon would blossom and bear fruit perennially, season by season, like the earth, our mother, and the sun, our father themselves, an inexhaustible, frictionless enthusiasm. We were partakers of the eternal sacrament. Whatever happened was equally essential to the ritual. Death itself made no difference to anything. Our calm, continuous condescence burst through the chains of circumstance and left us free forever to do our wills, which were one will, the will of him that sent us. Kind of like what they have in the Bible. Jesus didn't come with his own doctrine, but the one of the one that sent him, right? The walk up to the Refractory was one long romp with Dionysus. O oh, wise dear, Sister Athena, was it by chance that you chose that sturdy sunlight imp to lead us up the hill that night? Did you suspect that our hearts would see in him a symbol of our own serene and splendid hope? We looked into each other's eyes as we held his hands on the last steep winding path among the olives, and we did not speak, but an electric flame ran through his tiny body from one to the other, and we knew for the first time what huge happiness lay in ambush for our love. The silence of dinner shone with silken luster. It lasted long, so long, each moment charged with litanies of love. When coffee came, Big Lion himself broke the spell. I am going to the tower to sleep tonight, so you will be in charge of the stranger's house, Sir Peter. The duties are simple. If any wanderer should ask our hospitality, it is for you to extend it on behalf of the order. We knew no... We knew one wanderer who would come, and we would make him welcome. A bright torch and a casement ope at night to let the warm love in. But before you go across, you will do well to join us now that you have discovered your true wills in the Vesper ceremony of the Abbey, which we perform every night in the temple of my tower. Let us be going. <clears throat> we followed, hand in hand, along the smooth, broad, curving path that bordered the stream, cunningly bended to run along the crest of the bridge so that its power might be used to turn various mill wheels. The gathering shadows whispered subtle lyrics in our ears. The sense of spring conveyed superb imaginations to our senses. The sunset squandered its last scarlet on the sea, and the 
and purple that night began to burst into blossom of starlight. Over the hilltop before us hung the golden scimitar of the moon, and in the stillness of the faint heartbeat of the sea was heard as if the organ in in some enchanted cathedral were throbbing under the fingers of Merlin and transmuting the monotonous sadness of existence into a peaceful paan of the inexpressible jubilance of triumph, the te dium of mankind celebrating its final victory over the heathen hordes of despair. A turn in the path, and we came suddenly upon a cauldron-shaped depression in the hillside. At the bottom, a silver streak of foam darted among huge boulders, piled bombastically along the bed of the valley. Opposite jutting from the grassy slopes, there stood three stark needles of red rock, glowing still redder with some splash of crimson stolen from the storehouse of the sunset, and above the highest of the, there sprung a sudden shaft of stone against the skyline, a blind dome of marble rimmed with a balcony at the base crowned the tower, circular with many tall windows, gothic in design, but capped with fleur-de-lis. And this was set upon eight noble pillars, joined by arches which carried out the idea of the windows on a larger scale. When we reached the tower by a serpentine series of steps, megalithic stones laid into the mountainside, we saw that the floor of the vault was an elaborate mosaic. At the four quarters were four thrones of stone, and in the center a hexagonal altar of marble. Four of the principles of the abbey were already robed uh, were already robed for the ceremony, but they furnished themselves with four weapons, a lance, a chalice, a sword, and a disc, from a pillar which had a door and a staircase, which formed the only means of access to the upper rooms. Basil seated himself in one of the thrones, Sister Athena in another, while a very old man with a white beard and a young woman whom we had not yet seen took their places in the other two. Without formality of any sort beyond a series of knocks, the ceremony began. The impression was overwhelming. On the one hand, the vastness of the amphitheater, the sublimity of the scene, and the utter naturalness of the celebrants on the other. The amazing distinction of the prose and the sharp clarity and inevitability of the ideas. I can only remember one or two clauses of the credo. They ran thus. And I believe in one Gnostic and Catholic church of light, love, and liberty, the word of whose law is the lima. And I believe in the communion of saints, and for as much as meat and drink are transmuted in us daily into spiritual substance, I believe in the miracle of the Mass. And I believe in one baptism of wisdom, whereby we accomplish the miracle of incarnation. And I confess my life, one, individual and eternal, that was and is and is to come. I've always told myself that I had not a spark of religious feeling, yet Basil once told me that the text, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, ought to be translated, The wonderment at the forces of nature is the beginning of wisdom. He claims that everyone who is interested in science is necessarily religious, and that those who despise it and detest it are the real blasphemers. But I have certainly always been put off by the idea of ceremonial or ritual of any kind. There, again, Basil's ideas are fantastically different to other people's. He says, what about the forms and ceremonies used in 
an electric light plant. I gave a little jump when he made the remark. It was so destructive of all my ideas. Most ritual, he agrees, is vain observance. But if there is such a thing as the so-called spiritual force in man, it requires to be generated, collected, controlled, and applied by using the appropriate measures, and these form true ritual. And, in fact, the weird ceremony in progress in his Titan Tower produced a definite effect upon me, unintelligible as it was to me for the most part, on one hand, and repellent as it was to my Protestant instincts on the other. I could not help being struck by the first of the collects, Lord Visible and Sensible, of whom this earth is but a frozen spark, turning about thee with annual and diurnal motion, source of light, source of life, source of liberty, that thy perpetual radiance hearten us to continual labor and enjoyment, so that as we are constant partakers of thy bounty, we may in our particular orbit give out light and life, sustenance and joy to them that revolve about us, without diminution of substance or effulgence forever. The words were full of the deepest religious feeling and vibrated with a mysterious exaltation, and yet the most hardened materialist could not have objected to a single idea. Again, after invocation of the forces of birth and reproduction, all rose to their feet and addressed death with sublime simplicity, masking nothing, evading nothing, but facing a huge fact with serene dignity. The gesture of standing to meet death was nobly impressive. Term of all that liveth, whose name is inscrutable, be favorable unto us in thine hour. The service ended with an anthem which rolled like thunder among the hills and was re-echoed from the wall of the great rock of Telepilus. It was a very curious detail of life at the abbey that no one act emerged into the next insensibly. There were no abrupt changes. Life had been assimilated to the principle of the turbine as opposed to the reverberatory engine. Every act was equally a sacrament. The discontinuity and abruptness of ordinary life had been eliminated. A just proportion was consequently kept between the various interests. It was this as much as anything else that had helped me to recover from the obsession of drugs. I had been kept back from an emancipation by my reaction against the atmosphere in general. And my latent jealousy of Basil in particular, Lou not having been troubled by either of these, had slid out of her habit as insidiously if I may use the word, as she had slid into it. But the culminating joy of my heart was the completeness of the solution of all my problems. There was no possibility of a relapse because the cause of my downfall had been permanently removed. I could understand perfect how it was that Basil could take a dose of heroin or cocaine, could indulge in hashish, either our opium as simply and usefully as the ordinary man can order a cup of strong black coffee when he happens to want to work late at night. Well, don't most people maintain their physical addiction to caffeine? He had become completely master of himself because he had ceased to oppose himself to the current of spiritual willpower by which he was the vehicle. He had no fear or fascination with regard to any of these drugs. He knew that these two qualities were aspects of a single reaction, that of emotion to ignorance. He could use cocaine as a fencing master uses a rapier, as an expert without danger of wounding himself. Well, part of it was adulterous and him not knowing his dose, but 
Crowley sounds like he died of an OD of heroin. So, obviously didn't stay quit, right? About a fortnight after our first visit to the tower, a group of us was sitting on the terrace of the stranger's house. It was bright moonlight, and the peasants from the neighboring cottages had come in to enjoy the hospitality of the abbey. Song and dance were in full swing. Basil and I fell into a quiet chat. How long is it, by the way, he said, since you last took a dose of anything? I'm not quite sure, I answered, dreamily watching Lou and Lala, who had arrived a week since, with the apparatus I had required for my experiments. As they waltzed together on the court, they were both radiant. It seemed as if the moon had endowed them with her pure stuplety and splendor. I asked you, continued Big Lion, pulling at a big mirsham, an amber pipe of the Boer pattern, which he reserved for late at night, because I want you to take the fullest advantage of your situation. You've been tried in the crucible and came out pure gold, but it won't do for you to forget the privileges you have won by your ordeal. Do you remember what it says in the Book of the Law? I am the snake that giveth knowledge and delight and bright glory and stir the hearts of men with drunkenness to worship me. Take wine and strange drugs, whereof I will tell my prophet, and be drunk thereof. They shall not harm ye at all. Yes, I said slowly, and I thought it a bit daring. Might tempt people to be foolhardy, don't you think? Of course, agreed Basil. If you read it carelessly, and act on it rashly, with the blind faith of a fanatic, it might well, very well, lead to trouble. But nature is full of devices for eliminating anything that cannot master its environment. The words to worship me are all important. The only excuse for using a drug of any sort, whether it's quinine or epsom salt, is to assist nature to overcome some obstacle to her proper functions. The danger of so-called habit-forming drugs is that they fool you into trying to dodge the toil essential to spiritual and intellectual development. But they are not simply man-traps. There is nothing in nature which cannot be used for our benefit, and it is up to us to use it wisely. Now, in the work you have been doing in the last week, heroin might have helped you to concentrate your mind, and cocaine to overcome the effects of fatigue. And the reason you did not use them was that a burnt child dreads fire. We had the same trouble with teaching Hermes and Dionysus to swim. They found themselves in danger of being drowned and thought the best way was to avoid going near the water. But that didn't help them to use their natural facilities to the best advantage. So I made them face the sea again and again until they decided that the best way to avoid drowning was to learn how to deal with oceans in every detail. It sounds pretty obvious when you put it like that, yet while everyone agrees with me about the swimming, I am held down on all sides when I apply the same principles to the use of drugs. At this moment, Lala claimed me for a waltz, and Lou took Basil under her protection. After the dance, we all four sat down on the wall of the court and I took up the thread of the conversation. Well, you're quite right, of course, and I imagine you expected to be shouted out. Shout at. No, laughed Lemus. My love for humanity makes me an incurably optimistic donkey on all such points. I can see the defects of my in amrata. I expect men to be rational, courageous, and to applaud initiative, though an elementary reading of history tells one, with appalling reiteration, how every pioneer has been persecuted 
whether it's Galileo, Harvey, Gauguin, or Shelley. There is a universal outcry against any attempt to destroy the superstitions which hamper or foster the progress which helps the development of the race. Why should I escape the excommunication of Darwin, or the ostracism of Swinburne? Swinburne, as a matter of fact, I am consoled in my moments of weakness and depression by the knowledge that I am so bitterly abused and hated. It proves to me that my work, whether mistaken or not, is at least worthwhile. But that's a digression. Let's get back to the words, to worship me. They mean that things like heroin and alcohol may be and should be used for the purpose of worshiping. That is, entering into communion with the snake that giveth knowledge and delight and bright glory, which is the genius which lies in the core of every star. And every man and every woman is a star. The taking of a drug should be a carefully thought out and purposeful religious act. Well, if you take it as a Kundalini reference, you could say, well, our bodies are a storehouse of over 50 chemicals that produce drug-like highs, and if you can access them without the drugs, and you know, um, experience alone can teach you the right conditions in which the act is legitimate, that is, when it assists you to do your will. If a billiard player slams the balls around indiscriminately, he soon takes the edge off his game. But a golfer would be very foolish to leave his mashi out of his bag because, at one time, he got too fond of it and used it improperly and lost important matches in consequence. Now, with regard to you and Lou, I can't see that she has any particular occasion for using any of these drugs. She can do her will perfectly well without them, and her natural spirituality enables her to keep in continual communion with her innermost self, as her magical diary shows clearly enough. Even when she had poisoned herself to the point of insanity, her true instincts always asserted themselves at a crisis, that is, at any moment when you, the being whom it is her function to protect, was in danger, but there must be occasions in your work when the little more and how much it is could be added to your energy by a judicious dose of cocaine and enable you to overcome the cumulative forces of inertia, or when the effect of concentration is so severe that the mind insists on relieving itself by distracting your thoughts from the objects of your calculations. A little heroin would calm their clamor sufficiently long to enable you to get the thing done. Now, it is utterly wrong to force yourself to work from a sense of duty. The more thoroughly you succeed in analyzing your mind, the more surely you become able to recognize the moment when a supreme effort is likely to result in definite achievement. Nature is very quick to warn one when one makes an error. A drug should act instantaneously and brilliantly. When it fails to do so, you know that you shouldn't have taken it. Well, it can take minutes to take effect, but yeah. And that you should then call a halt and analyze the circumstances of the failure. We learn more from our failures than from our successes. And your magical record will tell you, by the end of the year, so accurately, what precise circumstances indicate the propriety of resorting to any drug, that in your second year you must be a great fool if you make even half a dozen mistakes. But, as the Book of the Law says, success is your proof. When you resort to such potent and dangerous expedients for increasing your natural powers, you must make sure that the end justifies the means. You're a scientific man. Stick to the method of science. 
wisdom is justified in her children, and I shall be surprised if you do not discover within the next twelve months that your great experiment, despite the unnecessary disasters which arose from your neglecting those words, to worship me, has been the means of developing your highest qualities and putting you among the first thinkers of our generation. The mandolin of Sister Cyprus broke into, ga broke into joyous, triumphant twitterings. It was like a musical comment upon the summary of the situation. The moon sank behind the hill, the peasants finished their wine, and went off singing to their cottages. Lou and I found ourselves alone under the stars. The breeze bore the murmur of the sea up the scented slopes. The lights in the town went out. The pole star stood above the summit of the rock. Our eyes were fixed on it. We could imagine the procession, the procession of the equinoxes as identical with our own perpetual traveling through time. Lou pressed my hand. I found myself repeating the words of the creed. I confess my life, one individual and eternal, that was and is and is to come. Her voice murmured in my ear. I believe in the communion of saints. I made the discovery that I was, after all, a profoundly religious man. All my life I had been looking for a creed which did not offend my moral or intellectual sense, and now I had come to understand the mysterious language of the people of the Abbey of Thelema. Be the priest, pure of body and soul. The love of Lou had consecrated me to do my will, to accomplish the great work. Be the priest, fervent of body and soul. The love of Lou not only kept me from the contamination of ideas and desires alien to my essential function in the universe, but inspired me to dynamic ecstasy. I do not know how long we sat under the stairs. A deep eternal peace sat like a dove, a triple tongue of flame upon our souls, which were one soul forever. Each of our lives was one individual and eternal, but each possessed its necessary and intimate relation with the other and both with the whole universe. I was more aware that our terrific tragedy had been necessary, after all, to our attainment, each uh, except a corn of wheat fell into the ground. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Every step in evolution is accompanied by a colossal catastrophe, as it seems when regarded as an isolated event, out of its context, as one might say, how fearful had been the price which man had paid for the conquest of the air, how much greater must be the indemnity demanded by inertia for the conquest of the spirit, for we are of more value than many sparrows. How blind we had been Though what appalling abysses of agony have we not been led in order that we might say that we had conquered the moral problem posted by the discoveries of organic chemistry, the master of tide and thunder against the juice of a flower. We had given the lie to the poet. This is the only battle he never was known to win. And the last page, we'll uh, get a third program for this chapter. <laughs>